How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here again. This time we're going to take a look at molecular orbital theory. So our objectives will be to explain bonding in terms of molecular orbital theory and determine bond order and draw molecular orbital diagrams for diatomic molecules. Remember, diatomic molecules just mean two di-atoms atomic molecules. So molecular orbital theory. So we've been talking about valence bond theory. And it's a good model for bonding and geometries of the molecules. But what it's not a good model for and what it doesn't do a good job of representing or explaining is excited states of molecules. So we know atoms can become excited uh, with atomic orbitals and stuff, but molecules can also become excited and valence bond theory is not really explaining that at all. Or also how molecules absorb light and are given color. So valence bond theory comes up short for those things. We need a different model for bonding to explain how these things happen. Uh, you know, so you may feel betrayed and you're like, why am I learning about valence bond theory model? If that's not accurate, why are we using this? And I just, you know, want to remind you guys that a globe's a model of the earth, right? And a globe's a great model for what the earth looks like in 3D, where different countries are in relation to other countries, but you're not going to bring a globe when you have to get to the pizza place, or if you're going hiking, you're going to use a different model of the earth then, right? So models, uh, depending on what they're being used for, you know, it, it, yeah. So depending on what you're trying to use the model for, you might want to use a different model. So let's talk about molecular orbital theory. So we've talked about atomic orbitals, which describe how electrons exist around a nucleus, what their wave function is. Molecular orbitals are going to be similar but different. How electrons exist on a molecule. What is the wave function for that electron when it's on a molecule? So we're no longer talking about, you know, just a single atom. So the electrons aren't thought of as orbiting a single atom anymore. We're going to think about how those electrons orbit the whole molecule. How do they fit into the molecule? So just a little comparison, a little Venn diagram. What's true about both of them? Both theories, we're talking about wave functions for electrons. We have two electrons per orbital with opposite spins. That's still the same. And they have definite amounts of energy. Those electrons and those orbitals have a definite amount of energy. That's still the same. So what's different between the two? Atomic orbitals, we're talking about just one atom. Molecular orbitals, we're talking about the whole molecule. So let's take a look at the simplest molecule, hydrogen, H2. So when two atomic orbitals overlap, we end up making two molecular orbitals, right? So one is going to be what we call a bonding orbital, which is going to be lower energy, right? And it kind of looks like those two orbitals merge together. They kind of bloop together and the electron density is found between the two nuclei. So we call that a bonding orbital. Well, Right, And it's lower energy because those electrons are attracted to both nuclei. So it's a lower energy state. We could also create an anti-bonding orbital, which tend to be higher energy. Right, So those electrons can also repel each other. So instead of the orbitals blooping together and merging, they could also repel each other. And we call those anti-bonding orbitals. And there's very little electron density between the nuclei. All right. So how do we name these orbitals that we made? Uh, well, we describe where the electrons are and what the molecular orbitals are made of. So first we're going to say they're sigma, right? They're found along the internuclear axis. So we're making sigma orbitals and we have bonding and anti-bonding orbitals and we made them from the one S atomic orbitals. So the way we're going to name these things here, we've made a sigma one S bonding molecular orbital. We would just call that, you know, sigma one S and the other one, Sigma star 1s. That star is telling us that it's an anti-bonding orbital. It's sigma because it's still along the internuclear axis and it's made from the 1s. All right. So molecular orbital diagrams, you know, basically you start with atomic orbitals on the left and right side. You go, all right, hydrogen. It's 1s. There's one electron. There's my atomic orbitals. In the middle, you put the molecular orbitals that you're making when they bond. So I put sigma 1s on the bottom because it's lower energy and sigma star 1s, the anti-bonding orbital on top because it's higher energy. So remember, this is what they look like. That's what they're representing. You don't actually draw these when you're drawing molecular orbital diagrams. I just thought it'd be helpful to remind you what they're representing. So now energy increases vertically, right? So we got higher energy up top. And now Pauli's exclusion principle still applies. So now we have these two electrons that we have to place into the molecular orbitals. 
And again, we start at the lowest energy ones and we follow all the same rules we've been following. So I put an up arrow, I put a down arrow, I've placed my two electrons into my molecular orbital and I'm, I'm done, I've done all my electrons. So practice, try drawing the molecular orbital diagram for HE2, all right? Remember atomic orbitals start on left and right side. So go ahead, pause it, try it, see what happens. All right, so we draw the atomic orbitals on the left and right side. HE is 1s2, so you can draw the 1s box. You draw the two arrows up down for each of them. Now you can draw the molecular orbitals in the middle. I'm combining two atomic orbitals, so I'm making two molecular orbitals. I end up with a sigma 1s with a lower energy and a sigma star 1s with higher energy. All right, so now Pauli's exclusion principle still applies. I got four electrons I got to place. So now I just place them. I go one, two on the lower energy and then three, four at the higher energy and I've placed all my electrons. All right, well, what about HE2 plus, right? Why don't you try doing that again? What's this plus tell me? This plus tells me I lost one electron. So I won't have four electrons to place anymore. Now I got three. Sometimes I like to remove it from the atomic orbitals just because I, I might forget to. Uh, so same process, draw the molecular orbitals in the middle fill them in with all the electrons that you got following the same rules and you end up with one two three electrons and that's going to be your molecular orbital diagram for he2 plus all right new concept bond order all right bond order this is the equation for it. it's one half times the number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons and this is going to describe the stability of the covalent bond it's basically going to tell us how many shared pairs of electrons do we have, right? So that's why we bother figuring out bond order. So single bonds have a bond order of one because you're sharing one pair. Double bonds will have a bond order of two because you're sharing two pairs and triple bonds have a bond order of three because you're sharing three pairs of electrons. Now, a special note, bond orders can be fractions. You know, you've never talked about a one and a half bond before, but it is totally possible, right? So let's take a look at some examples. So if I take a look at H2 molecule, what's the bond order here? Well, again, that's the equation for it. I go, how many bonding electrons do I have? Well, I just got those two. How many anti-bonding electrons do I have? I got none. So it's gonna be one half times two minus zero, which gives me a bond order one. And hey, once you know it, single bond, that's what I know about H2. I know hydrogen makes a single bond with another hydrogen. Everything's in line with what I already know. What about HE2? All right, well, let me see. Again, it's bond order is one half of the bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding. So I got two bonding electrons. I got two anti-bonding electrons. So I'm gonna end up with a bond order of zero, right? That tells me that no bond exists, all right? So special note, bonding molecular orbitals are at a lower energy than the atomic orbitals, right? So if energy is increasing going up the side, you know, why is this molecular orbital lower than the atomic orbital? It's because it has a lower energy than those atomic orbitals, right? So that drop right there is the lower energy. It's the difference in energy. This means that putting electrons into that bonding orbital is favored energetically. Anti-bonding molecular orbitals are at a higher energy than atomic orbitals, right? That's why I placed them up there. And now this higher energy offsets the energy of the bonding molecular orbital, right? If you take a look, I took the drop in energy for the bonding molecular orbital, and I'm showing you here that there's still, it's still at a higher energy. The anti-bonding orbital is at a higher energy than the drop for the bonding molecular orbital. So when we have the bonding electrons equal the anti-bonding electrons, the total energy is slightly higher than the individual atomic orbitals. So these atomic orbitals are going to be like, why am I going to bother bonding? If I'm just going to end up at a higher energy, you're not going to have a bond, right? So when you have a bond order of zero, no bond exists. Well, what about HE plus or HE2 plus? Well, that's slightly different, right? We lost one electron. So if I do the bonding orbital or bonding order for this, I go, all right, well, I got two bonding, but I only have one anti-bonding. So when I do my math, I end up with a bond order of one half. Now remember fractions are fine, right? You might be uncomfortable seeing it there, but a bond order as a fraction can exist, that's fine. Which also tells us, hey, we can expect to see the HE2 plus molecule, but not the HE2 molecule, because 
HE2 plus has a bond order of one half, whereas the HE2 has a bond order of zero. So summarize, can you explain bonding in terms of molecular orbital theory? Can you determine bond order and draw molecular orbital diagrams for diatomic molecules? I hope so. Goodbye. Okay,